what in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Well, let's open the Word of God to the 14th chapter of Mark. Th this section, with the beginning of chapter 14, takes us to the cross. We are now in the shadow of the cross. The great discourse sermon on the second coming of Christ is complete, and Mark now moves us into what I look at as the holy of holies of Scripture. We go inside the veil to see the blood sprinkled. This is the sacred ground of Holy Scripture, the account of the cross. And of course, all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, contain this. And as we go through chapters 14, 15, and 16, and the cross and resurrection is the theme of these, we're going to look at the details related to the Lord's death and His resurrection. But the opening 16 verses deal with the players in this drama. Of course, the stage belongs to Christ. He is the featured player in this unbelievable drama. Everybody else is a bit player. Everybody else is a walk-on. But they do have a role. There is the role played by the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders. There is the role played by Mary, who anoints Jesus. There is the role played by Judas, who betrays Him. And there's a role in His preparation for His death played even by His followers, the disciples. We're going to see the roles they play, and we're going to see Christ in center stage. But there is someone who isn't mentioned here who is the main player. You might say he is the supernatural director of the drama, and it is none other than God. Much like the book of Esther, in which everything that happens happens under the sovereign working of God, though God is not seen, everything that happens here in the preparation, in the trial, in the execution of Jesus is being carried out by the unseen hand of the invisible God. God is accomplishing His purpose through all of these role players who each have a function, a moment on the stage, but He's behind it all. Let me read these sixteen verses to you. Now the Passover and unleavened bread were two days away. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to seize Him by stealth and kill Him. For they were saying, not during the festival, otherwise there might be a riot of the people. While He was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper and reclining at the table, there came a woman with an alabaster vial of very costly perfume of pure nard, and she broke the vial and poured it over His head. But some were indignantly remarking to one another, why has this perfume been wasted? For this perfume might have been sold for over three hundred denarii and the money given to the poor. They were scolding her. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you bother her? She's done a good deed to me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you wish you can do good to them, but you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for the burial. Truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went off to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. They were glad when they heard this and promised to give him money. And he began seeking how to betray him at an opportune time. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed, His disciples said to Him, "'Where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover?' 
And He sent two of His disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, The teacher says, Where is my guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And He Himself will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Prepare for us there. The disciples went out and came to the city and found it just as He had told them, and they prepared the Passover. In this preparation for His death, the rulers play a role, Mary plays a role, Judas plays a role, and the disciples play a role. But the power behind the scenes is none other than God who is orchestrating every detail of the death of Christ. This is the unfolding of the divine plan. This was established by, Acts 2.23 says, the predetermined purpose of God. Jesus' death was not an accident. It was not a revolution gone bad. It was not a failed idea. It was a divine plan. In fact, in Acts 4 it says that you did what God purposed you would do in killing Jesus. Himself, Jesus said, the Son of Man has come to give His life a ransom for many. You see, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ has always been the focal point of Christianity, the heart of salvation, the key reality of the gospel and the central theme of the entire Bible. The cross is the apex of redemptive history, the ratification of the new covenant, the single atonement for sin, the satisfaction of divine justice, the propitiation of holy wrath, the epitome of sovereign love and grace, the necessary object of saving faith, and the only hope of eternal life. Because of the importance of the cross, it is previewed in the garden when God killed a sacrifice to cover a naked Adam and Eve, naked after they had sinned. It is previewed in the promise moments after the fall and the curse when God reveals that a man would come who would be wounded by Satan but who would crush Satan's head. The cross is previewed in Abel's acceptable sacrifice. The cross is forecast in the ark that saved eight souls. The cross is seen in the sacrificial animal that was found in the place of Isaac on Mount Moriah. The cross is in view in the Passover lambs that were slaughtered in Egypt whose death and blood protected the families from divine judgment. The cross is portrayed in the smitten rock in the wilderness which gave forth water to the thirsty people. The cross is previewed in the serpent lifted up in the desert for healing. The cross can be seen in the action of Boaz, the kinsman redeemer. The cross is anticipated in all Levitical sacrifices, and the cross is explicitly prophesied in detail in Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, and Zechariah 12, even down to the very things that happened to Jesus and the very words He said. When John the Baptist identified Jesus as the Messiah, he said He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Everybody knew that a lamb was only useful and acceptable to God if it was killed. John the Baptist knew then that the Messiah had to die. They all knew that was what the Old Testament made clear. Revelation 13, and though it's at the end of the Bible, takes us even before Scripture and before creation, 
Revelation 13 says that Jesus was the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world, meaning that the plan for the death of Christ was pre-creation. This is not a good idea gone bad. This is what has been planned from eternity past. The cross alone provides the penitent believer in Christ with the forgiveness of all his sins forever and the promise of eternal heaven and eternal joy. Understanding this, the significance of the cross, the sweeping breadth of its truth, no wonder we sing so many songs about the cross, right? The cross and the resurrection is the supreme testimony to God's goodness, His saving love, His righteousness. His grace, His mercy, His wisdom, His justice, His holiness, and every other attribute. That is why all four gospel writers end their histories of Jesus with the details concerning His death and resurrection. This is the high point of all history. Jesus, you know, had spoken of His death, hadn't He, on a number of occasions. He probably spoke of it very, very often. There are four times in the gospel of Mark, just in recent chapters, in which he made reference specifically to being arrested in Jerusalem, being mistreated, being killed, and rising the third day. Chapter 8, verse 31, chapter 9, verse 31, chapter 10, verse 33, and in a parable form in chapter 12, verse 7. So this is no surprise to any reader of Scripture, and it's no surprise to Jesus and shouldn't have been any surprise to those who had heard Him refer to His death. Throw away that notion of skeptics and critics and unbelievers that things went south on Jesus and something bad happened to His good intentions. This is where God has been taking Him as well as all redemptive history since before time began. Now as we come to chapter 14 then, we enter into the final words of Mark and He moves us toward the cross and the resurrection. We're going to look at preparation for His death. We're going to look at His agony, His betrayal, His arrest, His trial, His denial, the denial of Peter, the crucifixion and the resurrection. So these next weeks are going to be wonderfully thrilling weeks for us. Now as we come to chapter 14, again I remind you it is on Wednesday night that we find our Lord. He has been on the Mount of Olives looking back at the temple ground on the eastern side of Jerusalem, and He has just completed His great teaching on His second coming to establish His kingdom. That is finished now. Jesus ends the day then with the disciples talking about His second coming and His kingdom. Meanwhile, meanwhile, the leaders are intent on planning and pulling off His murder. How out of touch with reality are they? As the account in chapter 14 unfolds, we see the different players, and the first ones we meet are the religious leaders. But before we can look at them in verses 1 and 2, we've got to back up a moment and identify the one who is orchestrating everything by His providential power, and that is none other than God. That's implied in the opening statement. Now the Passover and unleavened bread were two days away. That is not incidental information. It is the purpose of God that on that Passover in A.D. 30, On the fourteenth of the month Nisan, at the very hour when the Passover lambs were being slain on the Passover, three in the afternoon, Jesus would die. That's pretty specific. God's plan was that in A.D. 30, Nisan 14, on the Passover on Friday, At 3 o'clock in the afternoon or about that time, 
When all the Passover lambs were beginning to be slaughtered, the true Passover would die. Jesus died at 3 o'clock on that Friday at that Passover. What makes it interesting is that is exactly the time the leaders didn't want to have to kill Him. That was the last time they would have wanted to murder Him. But that was God's time, and they, frankly, were not in charge. It's so important for you to see this because all the way through, we're going to acknowledge the unseen hand of God in every single detail. Now there were three main feasts the Jews celebrated, Feast of Pentecost, which was a kind of first fruits, Feast of Booths, the remembering the wandering in the wilderness, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Feast of Unleavened Bread, remember, commemorated the Exodus when they made the unleavened bread and left Egypt. These were celebrations to commemorate past events in their history. The Feast of Unleavened Bread was seven days long and commemorated the unleavened bread in the Exodus back in Exodus chapter 12, verses 15 to 20. It was held on Nisan 15th to 21st. Originally it was during barley harvest, according to Exodus and the book of Deuteronomy. The fourteenth was the day before. The day before the unleavened bread was Passover, and that's the order they appear in verse 1. The Passover is on the fourteenth, starting the fifteenth and running for seven days, Feast of Unleavened Bread. Because you remember that when they left Egypt, prior to their leaving with their unleavened bread, there was the Passover. Kill the lamb, put the blood on the doorpost and the lintel, and the angel of death will pass over you. And they were celebrating God's salvation of them in Egypt with their Passover. They still do it. It's the Jewish Seder. Passover, by the way, comes from a Hebrew word, Pesah, which means to jump over because the angel of death jumped over their blood-spattered houses in Egypt. The Feast of Unleavened Bread was then connected to the Passover so that they were terms used interchangeably. God's purpose, now let's follow this, God's purpose was to have the Lord Jesus, listen, eat the Passover with His disciples on Thursday night. Listen to this timetable. On Thursday night, when the Galilean Jews celebrated Passover, and we'll say more about that tonight, and that, that Passover celebration would go into midnight and beyond. So late Thursday night, they're having the Passover. They're into Friday. The plan was to have Jesus arrested very early in the morning, tried in the morning, which was illegal, sentenced in the morning, and crucified in the morning. Die at 3 Friday afternoon and be in the grave before 6 because He had to be three days in the grave. What an amazing timetable. And then rise again Sunday. If you got all these people together and tried to organize that, you couldn't pull it off. That kind of precision timetable. Mark identifies the fact that the Passover and unleavened bread were two days away. It's still Wednesday. Friday is the day for Jesus to die. This is God's plan. Jesus even said in John 10, 18, no one takes my life from me, I lay it down on myself. And you remember when He was hanging on the cross and He said, it is finished, and He died, they were shocked. The reason they were shocked is He screamed at the top of His voice before He died. And if He had the air in His lungs to scream at the top of His voice, He had enough air to survive. Many times His death was sought, many times. 
But his enemies were never able to kill him. Go back to chapter 3 in Mark and verse 6. You see an illustration of it there. But go back even before that. Go back to the first time his life was sought by Herod, who decided that he wanted to kill him while he was still an infant. By the time he got the information, he knew that this child who uh, he saw as a threat to his throne was under the age of two, and so he sent his soldiers into the region around Bethlehem and massacred all the male children to and under. But he missed Jesus because an angel had come to Joseph and warned him about this massacre and told him to flee to Egypt, not come back till Herod was dead. Very early in his ministry in uh, Nazareth, he went into the synagogue to preach according to Luke 4, and because he indicted the people for their sinfulness, literally the people in his own hometown who had known him all his life, tried to throw him off a cliff because his teaching so offended them. But he passed out of their midst and they didn't even realize it.